Hello? Yeah? I'm on? Okay. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but I had chills and tears in my eyes as they were singing that song. They actually showed me uh, the recording of that from the leadership conference they were at, and I was like, you have to sing that when we have youth church. Uh, it's beautiful, and I know they've, sang, they've been asked to sing that several other times. They're going to start their little uh, world tour with that song. Um, but it was beautiful, seriously, very creative. Uh, I'm very, very proud of these kids. Um, so we planned youth church a few weeks ago. It was supposed to be at the start of this month. And unfortunately, we had to uh, close down our school for a week uh, because of COVID. And so we had to postpone everything. We had lots of things planned for that day, but we had to postpone. And so the sermon that I prepared was prepared at the beginning of the month. I had it all set. And for some reason, this week, I started to feel a little doubtful about what I was going to speak about. And I'm sure many of you have heard of different pastors saying like, oh yeah, the Lord spoke to me last night and I decided to preach about something totally different. And when I thought about that, I'm always like, are they being honest? Is that really true? Does that really happen? Well, let me tell you, it happened to me too. So I am not speaking on what is on the, on the bulletin today. Uh, the title of my sermon was Get Out of Your Boat, and I will preach that sermon someday because that's one of my favorite stories. But today, um, if I have to give it a title, it's going to be titled Remember. So Remember is the title of my new sermon. So the last two years have been pretty crazy, to say the least. And so many people uh, had to fill their time, the boredom of quarantine, uh, doing something, picking up a new hobby, picking up a new craft. I learned how to play guitar, and I was like, I've always wanted to learn. And so I bought one super cheap guitar, and I just started strumming and making some weird sounds, and it ended up happening. But for some reason, I was not fulfilled. I was like, I have to do something else. Like, I need, I have so much time, so much energy, I need to do something else. So I decided to get a dog. Don't know why. I'm a cat person, but I decided that I had to get a puppy. Why not, right? I've always been obsessed with golden retrievers, and I thought, like, well, I'm going to get a golden retriever then, of course. Like, they're super cute, especially as puppies. I have to get one. But then I thought, okay, golden retrievers shed a lot, so maybe I should get a mix. So I decided to get a golden doodle. And you see, if you really know me, you know that I'm very stubborn. You know that when I have a thought in my head, I have to go and do it. That's who I am. I'm sorry. I wish I could change it about me, but that's just who I am. So if I decide one day I'm going to cut my hair, you best believe my hair will be cut the next day. If I want to take a trip uh, to Europe with my friends very last minute, I will buy my flights and I will go. I've done that before. I'm very, very like, once I have something in my head, I have to do it. So when the idea came of me getting a puppy, I decided, well, I'm going to get it. I was calling a bunch of different uh, breeders to get this kind of dog, and nothing was available. You see, I wasn't the only person who thought about getting a puppy. Several people had COVID babies as puppies. And so I called this one last place. It was in Virginia. I was living in Maryland at the time, and it was only an hour and a half away. And so I called them, and they said, there's one left one male puppy left and I wanted a male puppy so I thought all right so I called some of my friends we decided to all get in one of our cars and we decided to drive an hour and a half to see this puppy and at the time when I was on my way I was like all right I'm am I really about to do this am I really going to get this puppy I've never owned a dog before in my life my family has never we've never been pet people I guess uh, but we have had cats in the past and that's why I'm kind of like all right I can get a cat uh, we have the same personality, they're not really hard to manage, like I can do that, but like I said, I'm stubborn, I had to get a puppy. So we show up to the place, and we see uh, two puppies left, but one was about to get picked up, and the last one was the one that was reserved for me. And I see, as soon as I see that dog's face, I just see it, and I'm like, oh, he's so cute. And my roommate at the time, she was like, he's the cutest dog ever. I have a video of me literally looking at the dog for the first time and him just looking at me. He's so, so cute. And I thought, how am I going to get out of this one? How am I going to get out of this one? I have to leave with this puppy. There's no way that I'm going to leave it here. So, yes, I took the puppy with me home. Uh, the first couple months in, the, uh, in my apartment, I had a small apartment and uh, I was not sleeping, I was crying all the time, I felt like a new mom, right? I'm sure many of you can relate. I was not sleeping, I was crying, I was like, man, he wakes up every two hours, like, why can't I get some sleep? I was like, I'm too young for this, I'm too young for this, I cannot be doing this. 
So I ended up having buyer's remorse, and I thought, mm, maybe I can give him away. I was that fed up with my dog. And so I remember calling one of my friends, and he was like, don't worry, like, he can stay at my house, and I can help, or, you know, whatever, like, we got your back. And so when they say it takes a village, it really does. And so I pushed through, I ended up falling in love with my dog, and I had him for, let's just say, maybe three months or so. And since we were uh, in quarantine on lockdown, we were always home. I was working from home, didn't go anywhere, everything was closed, and in Maryland, everything was closed. So I was afraid to just leave my house for a second to go get food or to go run an errand because I had never left him alone. And so I think because his name is Little Sebastian, he's named after one of my, a character from one of my, one of my favorite shows, uh, I was afraid to leave Sebastian because he was so attached to me. He was always around me. He knew that I was always there. He kind of built this anxiety if I were to leave him, right? He's a COVID baby. They're, kind of, they're, they're just built different. So, so I was afraid to leave him alone. I was afraid. And my roommate was too, and so we took turns. If I had to run an errand, she would stay. If she had to run an errand, I would stay. But then one day we're like, all right, enough's enough. He has to stay alone. He has to. So finally, one day, we're like, all right, we're going to do it. It's okay if he barks, we're just going to walk out. It's okay. It's okay if he starts to, you know, want to come sneak out through the door with us. Like, he has to stay. So we do it. We tested it for maybe half an hour, and then we come back, and I was expecting to see the absolute worst. I was expecting to see just stuff on the floor, blinds on the floor, pillows on the floor. I was terrified. But when I walked in, he was just there sleeping. He didn't even hear me come inside. And at the time, he was tiny. And so when I see him, he's totally fine. He, he's, he's absolutely fine. He's not scared. He's not worried. He's happy to see me. And then we had this huge embrace, like, yes, you did it, boy. You did not go in the house. You're fine. And ever since then, he's been doing really well. So now I've had him for about a year and a half. He's almost two. He'll be two in February. And so the puppy years, oh, man, I've gotten some gray hairs because of him. He is a lot of work. And like I said, he's half golden retriever, so he's super energetic. And then he's half poodle, so he's super smart. And if any of you have seen him, a lot of my students have seen him, whether at camp or in the classroom, he's humongous. If he stands up, I'm obviously really small, but if he stands up, he's about my height. He's huge. He's about 65, 70 pounds. He's very tall. He's very smart. And he acts like a puppy still. And so the vets told me, like, well, when he's two, he'll start to calm down. That's just how they are. Um, but then I was at camp this summer, and one of my friends is a pre-vet um, major, and she said, yeah, I don't think it's two. I think it's four for his breed. I'm like, no, please don't tell me that. I've been waiting for two. So he has lots of energy. But one of the things he still struggles with, struggles with is when I leave him to go outside. When he has to go outside uh, to use the restroom, he is afraid that I'm not going to open the door for him to come back inside. I don't know why he has this anxiety, but he has this idea that I'm just not going to be there to open the door for him. In my house in Maryland, we had these huge sliding doors, and we had this backyard, and I would just let him out there to play. But sometimes he would not want to go outside unless I was going outside to play with him. I think he thinks we're siblings. He doesn't really understand that I'm the mom. But anyway, so now that we're in this house here in Arizona, we haven't played a ton outside because it's really hot. If you haven't noticed, it's really hot here. I'm still getting used to it. Um, but when he goes outside, he's very, very, like, just suspicious. He's suspicious of me. Like, he doesn't know that I'm going to open the door for him again. And so sometimes, like, when I wake up, I'll be brushing my teeth. I'll go out and let him out. And then I'll go back to, you know, whatever, finish brushing my teeth. And then I hear little cries. Like, he's a baby. He's like, no, let me in, let me in. That's why he's crying. But he doesn't understand that I'm going to let him back in. Like, it's going to be okay. I'm right here. I'm right here, Sebastian. Like, you don't have to freak out. It's going to be okay. But it's almost as if he forgets that he can trust me. I mean, I'm his caretaker. He relies on me for everything. I feed him. I make sure he goes out. I make sure he has a place to sleep every night. I make sure that he is getting all his ener puppy energy out. We go to the dog park. But for some reason, he forgets that he can trust me. So if you're, getting, if you're catching my drift, I have also been like Sebastian too. You see, I was super upset with my family 
when we left the beautiful region of New England. If you know me, I'm a diehard New England Patriots fan. Diehard New England, just everything sports. I'm very sad about our loss last night. I'm not ready to talk about it. Um, okay, let's not laugh that loud. Um, but anyway, I grew up in New England. I was born in Rhode Island. And then one day, my mom sat me down and said, we're moving to Georgia. And I thought, oh, no, my life is over. I was so upset that we were leaving this beautiful place. I mean, have you seen fall when you're in New England? It's so beautiful. The leaves, everything, just the culture, it's great. But I was upset, and I didn't understand why we had to leave. I questioned my mom. I was upset, but it happened. And that ended up being one of the greatest things that happened. We ended up moving, and all my family moved as well, like my aunts, uh, my cousin, my grandma, everyone, all, everyone, literally everyone moved to Georgia too. And it ended up being a great experience where I was able to grow. But at the time, I was upset. I was very upset. I was upset uh, when I was 15 years old, thinking of all the rules that my mom had for me. I was not allowed to go out with my friends. I was not allowed to go to football games. I went to a public school, so I didn't have the same luxury that academy kids have where everyone's an Adventist, uh, or mostly everyone. So I wasn't able to do things, and I was upset and frustrated at the time. But then now, in hindsight, I see that maybe it was good that my mom was more strict. Maybe it was good that I wasn't allowed to go out with my friends. Maybe it was good, but at the time, I didn't get it. I didn't understand. Um, so sometimes you might find yourself too frustrated with your parents for the rules they may have for you, and you may not get it. But sometimes, for me, not only was I frustrated with my mom in the past, but now, as an adult, I have found myself frustrated with God, so much so that I forget that I can trust him. I first experienced this my senior year of college. I went to the beautiful college of Southern Adventist University in Tennessee. If you're a senior and you want to go, go. That's my advice to you. Um, but I first experienced it. I had a great experience uh, in college all throughout. And then my senior year, I right about right before we started school, I was about to start my campus ministries job as the women's chaplain. No idea what that meant at the time or what would happen, but I was like, I'm excited. And my boyfriend was also going to be the men's chaplain of the dorm. So we both had this same job, and we were super excited. I had everything planned out. I thought I'd have a ring on my finger at the end of the school year. It was going to be perfect. So then, two days before school starts, he breaks up with me. I was absolutely devastated. Ask any of my friends. It was rough. Oh, it was really, really rough. And because I had to work with this guy, I was like, oh, there's no way I'm going to do that. Like, no. So I went into my chaplain's office and I said, hey, like, this is what's happening. I was crying a lot. We were talking. And I said, I can't do this, so I, I have to quit. Like, I, I can't. Like, there's no way that I can do this. She challenged me. She pushed me. And she basically was like, we're going to get through this together. I'm going to walk alongside you. It's going to be okay. So I decided, all right, I'll do it. I'll keep pushing through. And it ended up being one of the best years of my life. It's through that job of uh, women's chaplain that I was able to see my calling as a campus chaplain in the future or into pastoral ministry. And I ended up um, losing a ton of weight because I was dedicated and I was getting through that year. I ended up finding God for who he really was and really building on that relationship with him. I ended up strengthening all my friendships, my relationships, and I decided that I was going to have a good year no matter what. Even if I didn't feel good, I was going to have a good year, and I did. But at the time, when it first happened, I didn't feel that way at all. I felt terrible. And in that time, I doubted God's goodness. I doubted that God had a plan. You always hear that when you're going through something. God has a plan. But how is that part of God's plan when it's hurting me so much? But I realized then that it had to happen that way, and I had an incredible year. So you're thinking now, all right. Alexi, you're not doubting God's goodness then. Like, you've gone through so many things where you've been able to see that God's been faithful to you no matter what. I wish I could say that's true. But exactly a year later, after I graduated from college, I was a missionary on a tiny island called Palau. Beautiful place, beautiful people. It was just an incredible experience. But about halfway through my year in Palau, I decided that I had to leave. Nope, this is too hard. Where is God in this? I don't understand why God brought me out here. Why is it so hard? Why would God bring me to a place where it's going to be so difficult? And I questioned God, and I questioned him, and I just thought, 
well, you just brought me out here just to leave me high and dry. Like, there's no way. And then it wasn't until one of my friends who was there with me uh, had to sit me down, basically, and kind of slap me in the face and tell me, God called you here. Why would you leave? Like, just stick it out. Your kids need you. You need to be here. God called you here, so he's going to give you the strength. And it was through her words that I decided, all right, I got to push through. And so I pushed through, and I had one of the best years of my life. It was hard. It was hard being 9,000 miles away from my family. It was hard being in a different time zone. I was about 14 hours ahead of my family, so we could only talk for like an hour, uh, text during the day. Um, It was really hard. I had to wear um, long shorts, and it was really hot all the time. I had to wear long skirts, and it was really hot all the time. We couldn't drink coffee, and I really needed coffee being a teacher there. But there were so many rules that I had to abide by that it really made me question why I had to be out there. But I pushed through, and I had an incredible experience. I had 29 amazing eighth graders, and they absolutely changed my life, who I still keep in contact with. They just graduated high school this past year, and I still get to see them from time to time. So you think, all right, all right, now you know that you can't doubt God's faithfulness, because he's always good. He's always gotten you through in the past. Yet a year later, I was in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Whew. I was in seminary my first year, and I was deeply, deeply depressed. You see, I've never, ever experienced depression. I have a background in psychology, my degrees in psychology, my bachelor's. So I knew what it was, but I had never experienced it myself. And then when I was in seminary, I thought, well, why would I be depressed? Like, everything's fine. Like, I'm back home. Like, everything's good. But, I mean, I guess the snow did make me a little sad. It snowed all the time. Um, But for some reason, I was very, very sad. I'm an extrovert. I love talking. Clearly, I chose the right profession. But I love talking. I love being with people. I love being surrounded by my friends. And at the time, I didn't feel like I had a community. I had just had this incredible experience, this year-long experience, and I wanted to come back and share that with people and be able to have community. But I didn't have that. I was brand new. Uh, Because it snows all the time, people aren't out in the field throwing a football. Like, no, everyone's inside keeping warm. And so I felt really lonely. And so I went to therapy. I made some friends. And they ended up having a better experience. I'm not going to say it was the best year because it was not. It was hard. It was really, really hard. But I had to constantly remind myself that God was going to get me through it. And so I ended up graduating from seminary. I ended up having a better year, my second year there. And um, because of that, I was able to get my master's, which I had never thought I would get ever in a million years. But I was able to do that because God gave me the strength. So I wish I could say that that was the last time I doubted God's faithfulness. But it wasn't. I doubted it six months ago. I doubted it three months ago. I doubted it last week. I'm not going to stand here and say that I haven't questioned God's goodness or God's faithfulness or God's plan for my life. I'd be lying if I said that. And if we look in Scripture, we can find dozens upon dozens of people who had doubt too. We see the disciples and how they were always with Jesus, yet they still doubted. And when we read that in Scripture, we think, how in the world would they doubt God or Jesus if he was right there with them? But they still doubted. They were afraid sometimes. And people even that saw the miracles that Jesus was able to do even doubted that he was the Messiah. Lots of people doubted. But there's one specific group that I want to talk about and sit on for a second, and it's the group, um, the Israelites. We've heard many stories about them, many, many stories. And they kept themselves from reaching their promised land so many times because of the mistakes they made, made, because of the things that they said, because of the doubts they had, they kept themselves from reaching their promised land. Even when they escaped Egypt, after all the miracles that were made, they still doubted that they would even escape. When they reached that dead end, they even said, why would you bring us out here? Just to leave us here with nowhere to go? It's better for us to just go back. They doubted that they would actually get out, even after all the miracles, even after all the things that, was, that happened on their behalf. But they wanted to go back. They doubted. They complained in the wilderness and doubted again that they would even reach their promised land or that their leaders would be able to provide for them. They constantly doubted. They doubted so much that they started to disobey and they started to worship idols. 
They were afraid to scope out land and let their fears and doubts consume them. If we see in numbers, we see that they were afraid to scope out the land um, as well. And because of that, they weren't able to go and conquer that land. Hundreds of years passed before they could reach their promised land. We see it all throughout uh, the Old Testament, from Exodus to Joshua. We see it. They're always, always doubting. And so I'm sure many walked away as well and couldn't handle this waiting period because it seemed like it was long, and it was long. But those that stayed had to keep remembering what happened in order to trust God's faithfulness. You see, they passed that message on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And when they entered the promised land, they did set 12 stones in the Jordan River to remind them of when God had dried up the river for them to walk through. They needed to remember. It was important for them to remember. And we see in the Bible, every major event that a person in the Bible has gone through is sometimes marked and given a new name. You see, like, for example, where Jacob wrestled with God, uh, he named it Peniel, where he saw God face to face. It's done in order to not forget. It's done to mark an event. We might forget when things are going well. I don't know about you guys, but when things are going really well in my life, I sometimes neglect my relationship with God. Sometimes I'm like, well, I mean, everything's going well. Like, what do I even pray for? But we question God especially even more when things aren't going well. We question God and we get angry with God. But in those moments, we need to remember. Remember how God has been faithful in the past because he will do it again. You see, I gave you so many examples in my life where I questioned God's faithfulness, where I went through a tough time. But yet I still doubted. I still forgot. So I had to remember in order to move forward. Sometimes you have to look back to move forward. See, God has a plan for pain. It will not go in vain. I made a, I kind of made a statement the other day, and one of my students that is here laughed at me when I said it. Um, I wonder if he will catch this. But I do CrossFit, and it's funny to some, but I CrossFit because I love feeling strong. And especially as a smaller person, I want to be able to prove that I can lift something. I can do this. I can do that. Yeah, sure, I can help. I'm very, uh, I like to call myself athletic because I love sports, love watching and playing. But as far as like gym and exercise, I had never really gotten into it until I started doing CrossFit about two years ago. And the reason I like it so much is because I've been able to lift things that I never thought I could, been able to pull myself up when I never thought I could, and I've been able to see muscles come out of it um, as well. Uh, not just like, okay, I've gotten stronger, but be able to see kind of like the result. And it's just like, yeah, you get fired up. But one of the things I love the most, and I will say I feel this right now, is I love feeling sore. Now, sometimes when I'm sore and it hurts so bad, it hurts just to sit down or just to walk. I'm like, oh my gosh. And as I age, it's not, I'm not recovering as quickly as I used to. But I get sore uh, after doing an intense workout. Right now, my back hurts a little bit. I just did a bunch of wall balls and box jumps the other day, my workout um, on Thursday, and I'm still sore. But the thing is, with working out and muscles and gaining those muscles, in order to get the gains, you have to go through the pain. See, in order for your muscles to grow, they have to literally rip and shred, and that's why you're sore. That's the whole reason why you're sore, is because they are pulling apart in order to keep growing but it means that it's working. Sometimes when I have a workout in the gym and I don't feel anything, I'm like, did I do anything? Did I accomplish anything? But like I said, when you feel sore, it's like, yes, I feel good. I feel like I'm actually doing something. So when we go through hard times, we don't necessarily gravitate towards, well, it's making me stronger. At least, you know, that, I have that. No, let's be real, we're devastated. We question, why me? And we doubt God. And why did you let this happen? Why did you let this happen to me, God? I thought you had a plan for me. Dr. Heather Thompson Day, she sends out a Friday night text every week, and last night's was this. She says, in Genesis 28, Jacob is in the middle of the desert. He has just run from his brother and is on a 450-mile journey by foot to find a wife and seek refuge with his uncle Laban. I'm sure he is exhausted. I'm sure he questions his anointing. I'm sure he is thinking he has messed up too badly for God to be with him. And then in verse 12, he sees the heavens open 
and angels are ascending and descending, and Jesus Christ himself is standing above the ladder. And in verse 16, he says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was unaware of it. And so I went back and I read this, and I was like, what is she saying? Like, i got to read this for myself. And so if we'll turn to Genesis 28, you'll get to see what I read too. Let's turn to Genesis 28, and we're going to start at verse... Get there myself. I have so many stickers in here, everything's falling out. All right. So she described, too, that he was going through this tough time. He had to leave to go find a wife. And then we're going to start at verse 10. It's, it's titled, if you have like a subparagraph, Jacob's Dream at Bethel. Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and to all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. And so in verse 16 he says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. Hmm. I read that, and I think there have been many times where I've doubted God's goodness, God's faithfulness, but most importantly, or worse off, I've doubted that God was even with me. God, you just left me here, high and dry, all by myself. You just left me. You see, when we're going through tough times, we are so caught up in our pain, in our struggles, that we are so unaware of what God is doing or why things are the way they are. I teach freshmen and senior Bible, and we've talked about this. I can't even remember which class it was. But I've talked about how when we go through tough times, we want someone to blame. And sometimes that person is God. And we don't really see that there's so much going on that he's protecting us from, and yet we still have the audacity to complain to him. God, why are you letting this happen? Some of you are worried about what will happen after graduation. Am I going to go to college? Am I going to start working? Can I get into college? Which one should I go to? Where am I going to move to? There are lots of questions that come up after graduation. Maybe you are worried about how your family is going to pay your tuition bill, because it is expensive. Or maybe you're worried about, how am I going to pass calculus? It's so hard. I hear about that all the time in my senior Bible class. Or maybe you're worried, how am I going to get through that, that breakup? I was really into that boy. I was really into that girl. And I just don't know if I can get over this. Or maybe you're struggling with your mental health. And you don't know if you're ever going to get to a place of happiness and joy again. There are many, many questions but I know that the Lord can be right here in this place, right here in your pain, that angels can be ascending and descending on our behalf, and we can be totally unaware of it. Our theme this summer at camp, um, for those of you that did go to camp or maybe you worked there at camp this summer, you know that it was His Faithfulness Remains. We talked about it all summer. We sang songs about it. We had verses that pointed to it. That was our theme. We wanted it to really ingrain it in our campers, that his faithfulness remains. And so I want to let you know, too, that God's faithfulness remains always. It's who he is. He can't be anything that he is not. The Lord is with you. He is faithful. He will make a way, even if you are unaware of it. So if you're going through a tough time, remember. Remember how he's gotten you through in the past, because he will do it again. pray. So 
Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you for this day of rest. I know I need it. So God, I just pray that as we listen to this message today, may we walk away remembering all the times that you've been faithful in our lives because you continue to do so. God, when we're going through tough times, if we're going through tough times right now, I pray that you help us to remember how you've been faithful in the past. Help us, God. Help us to know that you are here, that you are present, even if we are unaware of it. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.